told myself that if I came back to YouTube, I was going to make normal, not weird, any no more murder, creepy stuff videos from now on. I'm, I was going to make cat videos or something, which is ironic because I really don't like cats. But here, let's give it a shot anyway. Pinky. Hi, this is Pinky. Wait, He's a start again. Hold on. This is Pinky. He's a male cat, domestic short hair. He's available for adoption. He's pet of the week, Placer County Animal Shelter. He's a very loving cat. Hang on to us, please. Pinky. 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 Whoa. 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 We got a wild cat on our hands. Pinky, settle down, bud. Careful, Cole. Careful. I get a catch pole. Somebody get a catch pole. Here, here. Oh. Pinky. Just set it over. No. Get a catch pole. Get a catch off over the ghetto? Yeah, because I'm not going to grab it. Oh, oh. Stop. Dude. Watch it. He's caught up in there. Yeah, Dis yeah. Disconnected from the dead. In ancient Egypt, cats were worshipped as gods, and, well, being honest, they really haven't seemed to forget it, now have they? I mean, we literally feed them, pick up their crap from a box, all for them to consistently show us their buttholes and knock things off the table. I think maybe one of my favorite things about the ancient Egyptian people, though, is that we can't seem to wrap our heads around the idea that ancient people were actually capable of creating absolutely stunning achievements in engineering with just a few rudimentary tools and an understanding of math. And well, the moment we can't wrap our heads around something, then of course, it must be aliens. According to mainstream Egyptologists, the story of the Ben Ben Stone is part of a religious allegory. But according to ancient astronaut theorists, the stone is based on an actual historical event. Blaming aliens or mystical powers for things we don't understand has always felt lazy to me. Aliens being one of the more convenient and laziest explanations of them all, especially given the complete lack of evidence for their existence. I'm not the first person to think this. I, hell, it's even got its own paradox. The, the Fermi paradox was named after the physicist Enrico Fermi, and it highlights the contradiction between the lack of evidence for extraterrestrial civilizations and various high estimates for their probability. Those estimates, in my opinion, are actually best explained by Carl Sagan when he spoke about the Drake equation on his show Cosmos. Here's a brief summary. This is one of the great questions. How many advanced civilizations capable, at least of radio astronomy, are there in the Milky Way galaxy? Let's call the number of such civilizations by the capital letter N. It's a number. It depends on many things. It depends on the total number of stars in the Milky Way. Let's call that um, N sub star. It depends on the fraction of stars that have planets. Let's call that F sub P. It depends on the average number of planets in a given solar system that are ecologically suitable for life. Let's call that N sub E. It depends on the fraction of suitable planets in which life actually arises. Call that F sub L. Depends on the fraction of inhabited planets on which intelligence emerges. Let's call that F sub I. And on the fraction of those planets in which the intelligent beings evolve a technical communicative civilization, call that F sub C. Finally, it depends on the fraction of a planet's lifetime that's graced by a technical civilization. Call that F sub L. If we multiply all these numbers together, we've estimated capital N, the number of civilizations. This equation, due mainly to Frank Drake of Cornell, is only a sentence. The verb is equals. So let's try to go through the program of this equation. By carefully counting the number of stars in small but representative regions of the sky, we find that the total number of stars in the Milky Way is about 400 billion. It's a lot of stars. What about planets? Well, in studies of double stars, in investigations of the 
motions of nearby stars. And in many theoretical studies, we get a strong hint that many, perhaps even most stars, are accompanied by planets. So let's take F sub P, the fraction of stars that have planets, as a quarter. Then the total number of planetary systems in the galaxy is 400 billion times a quarter, or 100 billion. We'll write down our running totals in red. Now, if each system were to have, say, 10 planets, as ours does, there would be 100 billion times 10, or a trillion worlds in the galaxy, a vast arena for the cosmic drama. In our own solar system, there are several bodies that might be suitable for life, life of some sort. There's the Earth, of course, but there are possibilities for Mars, for Titan, perhaps for Jupiter. If other systems are similar, there may be many suitable worlds per system, but to be conservative, let's choose N sub E equal two. Two worlds suitable for life per system. Then the number of planets in the galaxy that are suitable for life would be 100 billion times 2 or 200 billion. Now what about life? Under very general cosmic conditions, the molecules of life are readily made. They spontaneously self-assemble. It's conceivable that there might be some impediment, like some difficulty in the origin of the genetic code, say, although I think that's very unlikely given billions of years for evolution. On the Earth, life arose very fast after the planet was formed. So let's choose F sub L, the fraction of suitable worlds in which life does arise, as a half. In that case, the total number of planets in the Milky Way in which life has arisen once is 100 billion times 2 times a half, or again, 100 billion. 100 billion inhabited worlds. Now, the estimates get tougher. Many individually unlikely events had to occur for our species and our technology to emerge. On the other hand, there might be many different roads to high technology. Some scientists think that the path from trilobites to radio telescopes, or the equivalent, goes like a shot in all planetary systems. Other scientists disagree. Let's take some middle ground and choose F sub i as a tenth and F sub C is also a tenth, meaning that only 1%, a tenth times a tenth, of inhabited planets eventually produce a technical civilization. If we were to multiply all these factors together, we would find 100 billion times a tenth times a tenth, or 1 billion planets on which civilizations have arisen at least once. If the Drake Equation suggests that the universe should be teeming with life, and not just life, but intelligent life, then the Fermi Paradox asks the very fair question, why is there no evidence? Now, don't get me wrong, there are those who would say that there is evidence in UFO sightings and abduction stories. Hell, there's even a guy who claims to have worked in Area 51 on the propulsion systems for crashed UFOs, but science, for obvious reasons, doesn't see this as legitimate evidence. So, where are the millions of alien civilizations predicted by the Drake Equation? It's not as if we're not looking either. The research group SETI, which stands for the Search for Tr Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has been looking for signs of life since the 60s, and it's not like they haven't found anything in all of that time either. On August 15, 1977, a 72-second unexplained strong narrowband radio signal was received by Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope. When astronomers actually reviewed the data, they were so impressed, one of them actually circled the data and wrote the word WOW next to it in red pen. Here's a clip of what they recorded that day. There are more than a few answers to the Fermi Paradox, but I tend to think that one is more likely than the others. It's been suggested that other civilizations are just too far away to even know we're here, or that we are being observed by aliens right now, they just don't want to interfere with us. It's even been suggested that there is no paradox because no one else is out there. 
But of all the possible solutions, there is one that I think has actual evidence to back up, and it's a disturbing one. Now, what percentage of the lifetime of a planet is marked by a technical civilization? The Earth has harbored a civilization capable of radio astronomy only for a few decades, the last few decades, out of a lifetime of a few billion years. It's hardly out of the question that we might destroy ourselves tomorrow. If that's a typical case, then F sub big L would be a few decades divided by a few billion years, or one hundred millionth, a very small number. And then big N would be a billion times a hundred millionth, or N maybe just ten, ten civilizations, a tiny smattering, a pitiful few technological civilizations in the galaxy. It's called the Great Filter, and in short, it suggests that at a certain point during intelligent evolution, most species destroy themselves, and, well, that doesn't seem very far-fetched to me. There are numerous scientists who believe intelligence actually arose as a direct result of humans cooking their meat before they ate it, because we are, after all, predators. There's an argument to be made that in order for another advanced civilization to form, they most likely would be predators just like we are. Our eyes sit in front of our heads just like the vast majority of other predators were descended from the same animal that the great apes descended from, and to be honest, the great apes are rather horrific to one another. An unfamiliar chimp call raises the tension. It's an uncertain time. The size of the rival group is as yet unknown. Not far away, their neighbors are feeding in a fig tree, oblivious to the approaching dangers. The patrol moves off with a sense of purpose. They must remain silent until they close in on their rivals. The attack is on. To intimidate their opponents, the aggressors scream and drum on buttress roots. Several males corner an enemy female. It's a ferocious attack, and she's lucky to escape with her life. Others are not so fortunate. The battle won, a grisly scene unfolds. An enemy youngster has been caught and killed. The carcass is shared between members of the group and eaten. Killing a competitor makes sense if you want to protect your food supply. But exactly why they cannibalize the dead chimp is not fully understood. It may simply be a chance for some extra protein. At this very moment, a handful of world leaders hold the fate of all of humanity in their hands. A disagreement between them, an ego-driven attempt to conquer, a religiously motivated war, a financially motivated denial of science could literally kill every single human being on Earth. During the Cold War, it was referred to as mutually assured destruction, and in other words, it was a way for one country to tell another that you can't attack us because if you do, we can kill everyone on Earth. A grim logic was beginning to emerge. 
Nuclear disarmament was not achievable, yet nuclear war was unthinkable. By 1964, McNamara had concluded that his no cities plan was a dangerous illusion. War would only be avoided, he now thought, by the threat of mutual suicide. In other words, the Great Filter answers the Fermi paradox by suggesting that aliens won't talk to us because by the time they have the technology to do so, they end up using it to destroy themselves. And I can't help but feel like it's a colossal waste of potential. And I think it's evidenced all around us. It's a lot like buying a really expensive present for your asshole cat, only to find out that they couldn't care less about it and would rather lay in the box that it came in. I, I really do hate cats. Maybe I'll just stick to the creepy videos from now on. Thanks for watching.